be a producer with a hit show on Broadway. I want to be... Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Producer's Perspective podcast, episode number three. First uh, of all, I want to thank everyone for the fantastic feedback. Keep those comments coming. Uh, And if there are any folks out there that you want to hear from on future podcasts, do let me know. Send me an email and we'll try to line them up. Uh, However, on today's podcast, I'm thrilled to be sitting across from one of the people in the industry that I admire the most and someone that I've had the pleasure of working with when I was a company manager, both on Thoroughly Modern Millie and the Gypsy Revival starring Bernadette Peters. I'm talking about Nina Lannon, the founder of the Broadway general management firm Bespoke Theatricals, which is one of the general management powerhouse companies on Broadway. She and her office have general managed some of Broadway's biggest shows, including all the way back to Cats, Mamma Mia, Billy Elliot, Evita, Rocky, Color Purple, Motown, The River, Legally Blonde, 9 to 5, Upcoming School of Rock, and so on and so forth. If you want to see a long list of credits, go to IBDB. It just scrolls on and on forever. In addition, she was the chair of the Broadway League for two years and was the first woman to occupy that position in the league's 80-year history. Uh, In 2009, Crane's Business named her one of the 50 most powerful women in New York. Uh, And in my opinion, she also has the distinct reputation of being one of the classiest women on Broadway. Welcome, Nina. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. I'm delighted to be with you guys today. All right. First, can you just, in your own words, describe to me what a general manager's role is on a Broadway show? A general manager, I think, has the best job on Broadway. It's the most fun because we work with everybody who works on a Broadway show, and we connect to everyone. And basically, anyone can be a producer. They have to have a project, and they have to raise the money to do it. And if a producer wants to do just that and turn over a show to us, we will run with the rest of it. We will do the budgets for the show. We will negotiate all the contracts for the show. We will hire everyone. We will make certain that all of the departments on the show are engaged, that they have everything they need to do to get their work done. And by departments, I mean like the casting department, the scenic design department, the costume design department, the technical department. We make certain all of these areas of a show are staffed, staffed appropriately, and then we work with them to coordinate a schedule to bring the 200 odd people who are working on a Broadway show all to uh, reach a common goal when we have our first show. And you've obviously worked uh, on Broadway over the last two or three decades from all the way back to Cats to now. How has the role of the general manager shifted over the past few decades? Do you see any change or is it the same thing as when you started? Well, what has happened is so much more is being done now with marketing and with uh, dynamic ticket pricing. Uh, All of that didn't happen uh, two or three decades ago. So I find the general manager's job is being taken up more and more with those areas. We can be sitting into in many different meetings on marketing, such as you know dealing with the social media, dealing with um, yeah, with a with a rollout of, of how we're going to price uh, price a show, uh, reviewing the what is actually happening with ticket sales. We have so much more da- data in these areas than we had previously, and it requires um, maintenance and it requires reviewing that data. It's no good to produce data and not look at it. In the old days, let's say in the 80s and even into the early 90s, the general manager was much more involved with the designers and with the technical personnel in the development of the show. I really feel that a lot of the design process and the technical process is being left to the production managers of the show. I even had Natasha Katz, the lighting designer, ask me last year, Nina, why don't we see general managers in more of our production meetings? And I said, that's because we're taken up and we're busy in these other marketing meetings. We, I said, I like sitting with all of you guys. This is where all the creative stuff really happens. But I said, unfortunately, there's just so many hours in the day and we can't sit in as many of those meetings that we like to. And right, so you'd prefer a little bit of the of a throwback. Would you prefer to go back into the past a bit? And yes. Get what's what's happened in the industry over the last um, several years is there's also many more people working in the industry. I mean, it's not as simple as it was. And the more people you have uh, are working on a show, the more need there is for administration and coordination of those people. If there's 30 people working on a show, it's not that hard. If there's 300 it's much harder and that really falls to the general management office to coordinate the activities of all those people. 
It's funny you talk about being involved because that's something I remember about working with you on Gypsy. You really getting into the nitty gritty of the design and making sure that set would not only function but that we could also afford it. Well, that's part of my history. I started working on Cats, which was at you know in 1982 when it opened. It was the most expensive show on on Broadway and very complicated scenically. We had many different shops working on it. They all had to be coordinated. And so I, at a very early age, I became involved in that process of trying to understand the, the problems with the set. I also did Sunset Boulevard for uh, the really useful company, Andrew Lloyd Webber's company, in the 90s. And that, again, was $13 million at that time, which was uh, an unbelievable amount of money at that time. And again, involved um, items being constructed up in Canada, you know, costumes being made in Switzerland, in Italy, in, uh, in, um, in England. So there was an enormous amount of coordination in that. So it was just necessary to get involved in the physical production to that extent, because that's where the largest amount of dollars was being spent. And so $13 million for Sunset Boulevard in the 90s, and Cats, how much was it? Cats was capitalized at $3.9 million and actually cost five point two. But what was, I was actually discussing this with uh, Bob Wankel of the Schubert Organization yesterday. We never got any more money than the 3.9. I remember a stack of bills about two feet high on the company manager's desk, and the show was just making money each week. So every week, three or four more bills would get paid, and all of the vendors just waited patiently, because everyone knew they were working on a hit, for their bill to get paid. And it took about two months to, to pay all of the bills on that show. So even Cats, Cats, of what we think of now as this monster success, which obviously it was, took a little bit of time to get every to get everyone paid at the beginning of that run. Well, yes, but that was primarily because John Napier came to Bernie Jacobs and said, I have this great idea for the set, this back wall that flips down onto the stage and I want to do it. And, you know, that's a producer's decision for you. Bernie said, all right, go ahead and do it even though we had no money in the budget for it. I mean, that is, that is to me, is what a producer does, is really can, like as a manager, I could never make that kind of decision. But a producer can come in and take a, take a look at a show and say, no, it's worth it. I know the show's going to be a hit, and so I want to do this. Uh, same thing that happened on, uh, to a lesser extent, when I worked on Annie Get Your Gun with Barry Weisler. We, um, he waited four months for Reba McIntyre to be able to come in the show. And we cast the show with uh, interim uh, people in our lead role. We had practically no money at that point. I mean, it would have been wise to just close the show and be happy with the money we had made. But he hung on, and we all buckled up and tried to keep our expenses as low as possible. And in the end, Barry was right. Reba came into the show. It was a huge hit. It made money and helped support some of the bit of losses we had before that. Hmm. So... What do you think cats would cost today? Well, funny you ask me that because there is talk of a revival of cats, and I'm going to sit down next week, dust off my old production books, and work on a new budget for cats. And what's fascinating in the in the intervening years is, for example, on the productions that have occurred in Asia and in Europe and in uh, London right now, where it's a huge success on the on the West End. Um, the, the unitards, for example, are photocopied in China onto the, I mean, in the old days, they were hand painted. Now they can be photocopied. With 3D printing right now, I'm really wondering, I mean, now we can 3D, I could print the 3D print props in this conference room here. So um, I'm hoping that will help us a bit too, the whole 3D printing aspect, which I think will be a fascinating thing to get into. And again, that's what interests me. I'm fascinated to see if 3D printing can help making the three times life-size props easier, cheaper for us. So you talked a little bit about your beginnings on Cats. How did you end up as a general manager? What was your path? Everyone I talk to seems to have a different path. What was yours? Oh, like many, many people, I, you know, I uh, graduated from University of California, Berkeley. I was a stage manager. I stage managed a bit for ACT and uh, San Francisco Opera in San Francisco, and then decided to move to New York because this is where the center of theater was. I had no idea what a general manager did, but I, when I interviewed at a very prominent um, general management firm, I figured if it didn't work out, these are the folks who hire stage managers, so they would hire me as a stage manager. 
it obviously did work out. I worked for them for 13 years until one of the partners died and then opened my own office. And along the way, any great advice that you got as you were coming up early in your career that you still remember to this day? Any mentors say to you, kid, this is what you should do. This is what you should remember to work on Broadway. Well, I mean, Tyler and, and Peter, who were the partners I worked for, Tyler Gatchel and Peter Neufeld, were incredibly supportive. And they always, uh, they created a good home in their office. So, and they also exposed everyone in their office to the history of theater. I remember they took everybody in the office out to various benefits and really included them in the entire theatrical community and tried to introduce them to the theatrical community. So I've tried to emulate that in the offices that I, you know, have, have set up. So I remember that very, very carefully. There was a wonderful production supervisor, um, Peter Feller, who always said, don't be the victim. And, the, I, and he was uh, wonderful, and that also has sort of stuck with me in many ways. And I tell that to, to sometimes young managers who sometimes are just um, uh, too, too ready to apologize for their actions and when something goes wrong. And I say, don't give other people a stick to beat you with. Don't do that. You, you can apologize if there was a mistake but don't over-apologize or just acknowledge a mistake and say, I'm going to make this right and I'm going to move forward. But if you start going around beating yourself up, somebody else is going to beat you up and, and don't do that. That's great advice. And if you could do it over again, is there anything about your training you'd do differently? Or another way to phrase this question is, what do you think is the best training for someone who says, I want to be a general manager? Well, I would say to anybody coming in, put yourself in the place with the most energy and the most excitement and the most activity. The only regret I had is perhaps right out of college I should have come to New York and not worked at ACT and San Francisco Opera, although I love my experiences there. Because I, I do think people coming out of school have an enormous amount of energy. And it's seductive and it's interesting and I think um, incredibly appealing to would-be employers. So I think those folks should just put themselves in front of work. And I do tell people when they meet with me, try not to just work in an office with one person because unless you're, you really like that person or you're doing this as a short-term uh, uh, job, because you don't want to be just sitting in an office answering the phones or doing correspondence with somebody, unless that person's really, really um, a genius or there's some uh, extenuating circumstance. But I say, get yourself in a position where you can just bump into as many people as possible. You know, as, as many people have said to me, and some designers, when I hire them, they say, I just want to be in an interesting room. I want to be in a room with interesting people. No matter what happens, if the outcome is good or bad or whatever, but it's going to be interesting. I want to be with those people. And I think that's what you have to think about in this business, because it is a collaborative business. And it's all about working with people. We work with people on one show, and then we work with a sort of different assortment of those same people on another show, or half of those people again on another show. So it's about, about being in touch with all of these uh, creative people we have in our business. Now, you do obviously lots of different types of shows. You straight plays, revivals, musicals. But it does seem to me that this office over the years has been the go-to office for big musicals that start in London and then come over here. Obviously, Mamma Mia, Billy Elliot, Ghost came over, Dirty Dancing, which didn't come to Broadway, but toured. What, what, I'm still trying to figure out what works in London versus what works here. What do you think it, what does it take for a show to work on both sides of the pond? Oh, that's, a, that's an interesting question. I, you know, certainly you, you, we all understand that the financial uh, parameters of London are quite different than here. They're not, so you have a more leeway in London. Generally, I think if something really works in London, it's going to really work here. If something only works in London because the costs are cheaper or the structure is different or it's yeah. very uh, specifically English, then no, it's probably not going to work here. But because I think shows can run longer in London than they can here, and uh, our competition seems um, somewhat um, stronger here. The competition with other shows and selling tickets and our structure here. So um, I, I don't have an answer for that. What do you think the differences are between a West End producer and a Broadway producer? Anything we can learn from them, or stylistically, how do they? 
How did oh, they do? I think it's much more of a sort of club and much more chummy over in in uh, in the West End. There's a group of people who uh, have been a part of the business for a very long time, and they will always be a part of the business. Here, I think we have a lot more um, business people uh, investing in shows, trying to produce shows, people who have made money in other disciplines and, and are, are coming to Broadway to either make money or lose money. Now, one of the reasons I started into a uh, with a management career is because I wanted to learn the business side of Broadway before I started producing. It seems like a natural way to learn all the different aspects of it. Have you ever wanted to produce? I find, um, I, I, I have thought of a couple of shows, but what I like and what I said at the beginning of this interview was working with all of these different people in the business. I love all the people backstage, I love talking to prop people, wig people, and so that's really where my passion is, is really trying to help all of them work better, trying to make every department on a show work better. The, when the, the, bit I, the times I have moved more into producing, it's kind of a different energy producing. It requires, um, for example, longer meetings and longer conversations. I doubt in this office here if we write anything longer than two pages at the most because we're typically spending the day answering questions and answering emails and just trying to get other people moving forward. And so it is a different type of energy. And, and to do both at the same time, I think, is very difficult. So Broadway has obviously, over the years, been called the Fabulous Invalid, yet last week we sent this record-setting week, attendance is up, grosses are up, we have shows grossing near $3 million. If you were a doctor and Broadway was the patient, how would you describe its health right now? Great, stable, critical condition, where do you think we are right now? I suppose now? I'd have to say stable. I, I don't, I, I, you know, the, we can never be a sort of, in a way, growth industry because we have a limited number of theaters on Broadway that we have to fit the shows into. What is worrisome now is, with the advent of premium ticket pricing, what has become the norm or the news, as you um, referred to from last week, of 1.5, 1.6, 1.8 million dollar grosses. So a show that might be doing 90% of capacity but not pulling in a lot of premium tickets, doing 750 or 800, is almost seen as a loser show, which is kind of bad when we say that a show that is doing like 80% of capacity but selling normal price tickets isn't like up in the top uh, 10 or 20 shows. So that's kind of a worrisome development because I think Broadway should be a place where all types of people can come and see all different types of shows. But if we are looking for shows that are grossing in the 1.5, 1.6 area, you obviously are looking for musicals or plays with stars. So what do you think if you, again, you're the doctor and we're stable and you want to get us a little healthier, any prescription you would, would give us or how do we combat that specific issue? Well, what, what seems frustrating sometimes is the production costs for getting a show up and particularly also, you know, advertising a new show are so high that, that to do limited runs is really tricky. Like, what if I had a really nice show with no star in it and I wanted to do a 12-week run on Broadway? And let's assume that I could put it in a theater. It would almost be impossible to do. But, I mean, as you yourself know, having done limited runs of plays, even with stars, when a producer comes to us and we do budgets and we can barely, you know, we say, all right, if we sell 100% of our tickets, you know, you might recoup 120% of your investment in 16 weeks. That doesn't look all that great. So I wish there was a way we could, you know, have more turnover of shows on Broadway, you know, do more limited runs, uh, that it wouldn't cost so much to launch a show on Broadway. And I suppose when I say, you know, I'd like to see more shows coming and going, we do have a lot of long-running musicals that really, I mean, some people would say clog up some of our theaters. But those investors, they have a right to make as much money as they, as they can from their shows. Yeah, that's something that I've written about extensively, how these, we've gotten so much better at keeping our shows going for, I mean, the, the mega decade-long running show, what didn't exist before, the right. Cats, Les Mis world, and now it is, it's some right. might say clogging. Right. Up. Now, you've worked with a lot of producers, obviously, in your 50 to 100 shows you've worked on. I won't ask you on the record who your favorites are, but what your favorite producers or who you think the best are out there, what characteristics do you think they share? 
Well, I think the characteristics they share are that they're very clear about the work that they want to do and the work that they want the general managers to do and where they want to give input. I mean, it's nice for us to understand early on whether a, a producer wants us to just perhaps move ahead with all the contracting in a show, wants to just concentrate on, uh, maybe the producer just wants to concentrate on the advertising. Some producers don't want to have anything to do with the physical production of a show. And it's nice for that to be clear um, right at the beginning, and it's nice um, not to be second-guessed uh, with that. Um, what the hardest for us is when we work on a show with three or four active producers and they haven't really selected a lead producer so that we have to run all decisions by three or four or more people. Um, that is very difficult. It's, it's because we do make decisions um, uh, quickly sometimes in, in our business and particularly the last four weeks before our show opens, you are making hundreds of decisions daily and you need a quick turnaround. It's something, obviously, that I think that we probably need to move faster, in my opinion, at all those things, and the more and more, not only lead producers now, but the, of course, the multitude of above the title producers, things do tend to move a little slowly at times. Well, that's what I said, just even on the general management side, just coordinating the more people that work on a show. You used to have an ad agency with one account exec. You used to just have a one press agent you would deal with. Now everybody not only has assistants, but then there are many people in all of different areas, in marketing, in social media, in online buying, in, you know, whatever, media buying, TV buying, you know. You're now dealing, when you go to an ad meeting, even from the ad agency side, you used to only have three people there, let's say, a creative person, your account exec, and, and an executive at the ad agency. Now there are at least 13, 15 people in the room. So what I... Our first uh, podcast was with Rick Miramontes, who famously last last year touched every single nominee for Best Musical. He worked on all of them. And sometimes I'm sure you are, I think this season even, you were asked to work on shows that may be considered competing against each other, or at least for a Tony. How do you deal with conflicts in the industry like that? Well, I mean, everyone says, you know, if you're at all successful in this industry, you're conflicted. Everyone's conflicted in this industry. But um, we usually separate it on a practical level. In the office, we usually separate it between people working on a show. People working on one musical that's going to open in a season aren't working on the other musical that's opening on a season. I mean, I think plays and musicals have very separate uh, audiences. I don't think, you know, our audience for the, uh, uh, the audience for, let's say, the audience coming up is the Motown audience, for example. I think they're totally different audiences. But we basically focus on, uh, on just that show, on each show. I mean, I look at each show kind of individually, and we work very hard to um, just sell as many tickets as we can for that show. And what do you think the best training ground is for someone who comes to your office and says, Nina, I want to be a producer. You're an executive producer, you're a general manager, you've worked with all these people. I, I, I don't have a billion dollars in the bank. I didn't make a lot of money in another industry, but I want to be successful. Some people say the days of, you know, the David Merricks, the one person coming up through the business are over. What kind of advice would you give to someone? Well, I think what, what you did at starting out in a management position and then moving into producing is a good idea. I also see that... Um, uh, Roy Furman has done, a producer has done a wonderful job at taking some young producers under his wing, allowing them to come into some shows that he's worked on for a nominal investment in, in which, in, and allowing them to participate in all the advertising meetings and to be around the production as much as possible. So I think that's one way to get into the pipeline of producing as well. Um, I'm working with uh, an actor and a choreographer now who have banded together and they've formed a producing group and have invested in a couple of shows on Broadway. So it, I, think it's a, I think it's great actually for anyone in the industry to start looking at producing and management because I think it opens up, uh, it opens up your eyes basically as to the struggles we in the general management trenches feel <laughs> and go through every day. That is true for sure. Okay, last question. Uh, I want you to imagine the genie from Aladdin shows up at your door and says, Nina Landon, I'm going to grant you one wish. You can change anything you want about Broadway. Anything. One wish, it changes overnight. What's the one thing you would change? 
Uh, off the top of my head, without taking too much time, I would say one of my goals for Broadway, and I would like that Jeannie's help in doing it, is to increase the diversity of the folks we have working backstage in our theater and also on stage. I think it's very important that the people we have working in this industry, which has a footprint far larger than the actual business we do, I mean, people around the world look at Broadway, and I think we should have more people of color on our stages, and I think we should have more people of color working backstage. And a lot of people would argue, I think, that that would help translate to more people of color in the audience. Yes, it would. It's just, it's obvious. I mean, I could always see that working on shows like Flower Drum Song, and when I were, uh, worked in the Equity Building, you could just tell. And when Jelly's Last Jam and my office was also in the Equity Building, you, the building was all flooded then with, with uh, actors of, of uh, different ethnicities when those shows were happening. And it was fantastic to see that. And uh, I don't think we do a good enough job at that on Broadway right now. Well, it's a great goal for, for all of us working on Broadway. I want to thank Nina for taking time from her incredibly busy day to speak to us. That's it for episode three of the Producer's Perspective podcast. Next week's guest will be none other than Tony Award-winning playwright Terrence McNally, so make sure you subscribe so you don't miss it. Until then, 